Welcome everyone to the Council's SME's first talk of 2022 on the industry applications of artificial intelligence. My name is Joya Scarlata and I am the moderator for today's discussion. Just a brief uh, introduction of who I am. I received my bachelor's and master's from Boston University and then my MBA from the Jack Welsh Management Institute. I started my career working for a prominent think tank and a government consulting firm out of Washington, DC before I made my switch um, into marketing. I am currently the director of digital marketing of Inter IT. I also view myself as an AI enthusiast where I have presented at a number of conferences and webinars about AI and marketing. And I also write about this topic. But before I continue, I would like to invite the chairman of the SME, Mr. Vinod Madok, to speak briefly about the association and its mission. Mr. Madok? In just a few years, artificial intelligence has grown from a niche specialized discipline to a must have for organizations all over the world. But not all artificial intelligence is appropriate for every company or industrial sector. Therefore, there is need to understand to know what is, uh, what is needed for a particular business or industry. The purpose of this webinar is to provide an understanding of what can be and is being done in certain businesses industrial undertakings to help them to bring these technologies to the forefront in their work. We have with us some very eminent speakers who, who will tell you as to their experiences and AI technologies in the various spheres of work. Our speakers today are Mr. Aftar, Mr. Hariharan Ramakrishna Madhasan, and Mr. Mayur Sridhasai, founder of uh, Somerset in this capital market. They have deep knowledge of IA and are, in, are involved in designing and providing AI support to the respective organizations. I'm sure from what they tell you, you will learn quite a lot. And on, on behalf of you all and myself and the council, I warmly welcome them and thank them for sparing their valuable time to be a part of this webinar. For those who are not aware, Council SME has been promoted by a group of highly regarded influential professional and businessmen. It is a not-for-profit organization. It's a premier peer uh, network forum for mid-sized businesses. It provides opportunities, opportunities to mid-sized businesses to interact with foremost experts, domestic and international business and government leaders, professionals, and also among themselves to learn about new emerging business trends, new business opportunities, and to find solutions to business challenges faced by them. For this purpose, Council SME uses various formats like interactive meetings, seminars, of course, these days we are using webinars due to COVID restriction. We provide analytical and special reports, advisories, we mentor, some events organized the Council SME include interactive session with Commercial Council of the American Embassy here in India, conversation with industry leaders, 
eminent experts, bankers, lawyers, on varied subjects like how to raise funds, funding options. <clears throat> income tax and sales tax and GST matters, effective business leadership, risk mitigation, listing on BSC, contract and labor laws. Before I hand over to Joya, I would like to thank her for the valuable input that she has provided for this webinar and accepting our invitation to moderate it. Additionally, I would also like to thank Gurdeep Singh, a member of our council for his unflinching support to get this webinar going. Thank you. Now over to you, Joya. Thank you, Mr. Madok. Hmm. So, Let's quickly talk about artificial intelligence. As we know, AI, simply put, is where computers think and act like humans. And there's enormous, uh, there's a number of reasons why AI is important in today's society. AI technologies is able to absorb an enormous amount of data, analyze these data sets, and make complex decisions based off of that. So at its core, AI, machine learning, deep learning, they, all of these, they provide a foundational future of business decision makings. So outside <clears throat> of AI playing such a pivotal role in our day-to-day -day lives, it is also transforming industries across the board, such as supply chain, manufacturing, uh, retail, and we have three very respective and esteemed speakers who will discuss this very topic, how AI is playing a role in their respective industries. Before I introduce our first speaker, I would like to remind everyone to place themselves on mute. If you do have any questions, we will have a Q&A session at the very end. But if you do think of a question, feel free to uh, message me in the chat. Uh, with that said, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Mr. Mayor Sirdesi, who is the founder and he currently runs a healthcare focused PE firm known as Somerset Indus Capital Partners, which is focused on investments in products and service placement uh, platforms in the SME sector of healthcare in India. Mr. Sirdesi has over 25 years of experience in the healthcare and pharma industries. And he also currently serves on the board of directors of IIT Bombay Alumni Association. So please help me welcome Mr. Sir Desi. Uh, thanks, Joy. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yeah, so thank you so much. And, and uh, it's a uh, good evening to uh, all the ladies and gentlemen on, on this webinar. And uh, thanks to the council SME for giving me an opportunity to present uh, today. So uh, before I start the topic, I'll just give you a little bit of background on what, what we are. Uh, so uh, I'm a founder of a private equity fund uh, called Somerset Invest Capital Partners, which is a healthcare-focused private equity fund. Uh, we, we are an impact, uh, social impact healthcare fund, uh, which focuses on ESG investing and, and sort of uh, creating impact in the healthcare space. Saying so, most of our investments are lower tier markets. We invest across the healthcare spectrum, right from pharma, medtech, diagnostics, hospitals, clinics, uh, uh, nutrition, wellness, digital health, insurance, uh, the whole, whole sort of space. We typically look at uh, sort of mature companies to invest into, uh, but we do a lot of work with the uh, early stage and startup community and also in, in, in sort of uh, focusing on, on the digital health side. Um, let me give you a little bit of background on, on healthcare and, and, and what it stands in India, because I think that's, that's a good sort of place to start off with. I think healthcare in India basically uh, is, is, is fairly large. Uh, I mean, uh, as of today, it's about two or $370 billion. Um, a lot of the space is pharma and, and the hospital space, uh, but all the other areas like diagnostics, especially on the COVID uh, situation, 
digital health, uh, medical insurance, uh, farm, uh, pharmacies, uh, med tech, all these are sort of gaining scale. And I think as, as we go along in, in the future, uh, you are going to see many more avenues of healthcare opening up, including the, the whole digital health uh, insurance. Uh, you know, the government is, is, is doing a lot more in, in healthcare in India, the Ayushman Bharat scheme, which uh, affects lower tier population. I think that, that too also uh, leads to a lot more in terms of uh, healthcare uh, in, in the country. What do I look at digital health? I think digital health in, in, in India or anywhere in the world is, is not a standalone activity. It's an enabler for providing healthcare and healthcare access in the market. So whether it's hospitals, diagnostics, you know, med tech, pharma, all these, uh, digital health sort of is an integrator which plays on, on top of that. And I think uh, 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 digital health requires a lot more support with doctors, et cetera. But AI ML, and I think that whole uh, piece basically also ensures that you can provide and, and, and uh, healthcare uh, even without the support of doctors in, in, in sort of settings where, where doctors are not available. I think digital health in India basically, uh, uh, or, or anywhere in the world, is based on three pillars. One is uh, the penetration of internet. The second is the adoption of, uh, of, uh, by doctors. And the third is, is actually insurance and the payer mechanism. I think what we've seen over the last uh, decade is, is you know, internet penetration has been massive in this country. Um, I think two areas where which were struggling to grow uh, were the insurance penetration and, and doctor adoption. Insurance penetration, I think, uh, uh, since about 2018-19 with the government announcing the Ayushman Bharat scheme. I think that has sort of uh, uh, escalated that whole piece uh, to a point where now it, it is making uh, the payer mechanisms in, in, uh, are making uh, and an sort of effect in the country. I think the biggest challenge was adoption by doctors. And, and I, COVID has resulted in, in a big change in that space. I think uh, digital health where doctors are ready to adopt to digital health uh, has been a big, big game changer in this market. I think going forward, you will see many more business models coming out in digital health, uh, which will be supported not just by doctors, but with AI support also in, in, in that case. So that's where we believe the, uh, sort of the whole digital health AI piece stands of uh, today. How does it is AI being played in, in, in the healthcare space as of today? If you really see healthcare spans of three, three areas, prevention and early detection, diagnosis, and treatment and care management. If you see AI today is, is fairly prevalent and, is, and, and there's a lot more work happening on the prevention and early detection, and that is something which I would call a screening. Uh, it is slowly moving in the diagnostic sector, I think to get to treatment and clinical applications, et cetera, there is going to be a lot more data required to support that. But I think there is, there is a lot of movement in, in that direction too. So over a period of time, you're going to see this whole healthcare spectrum, right from screening to diagnosis to treatment being, being included in this whole, whole treat, uh, area. So early stages, you'll see imaging, lab applications, pathology, et cetera, something which is coming of age. But uh, things like robotics, et cetera, are going to take some time because of the fact that it, it requires a much greater level of uh, accuracy, much more, more sort of data support uh, to that effect. So where do I see it, uh, uh, applications being used mostly? It, it is today in the diagnostic and screening area. I think that is where uh, you, you see most of it. Uh, uh, clinical decision-making or, or actually working in, in hospitals in triage and et cetera. I think you're slowly seeing applications there but it, it still takes time. A lot more is, is required in terms of data to make AI meaningful in healthcare today. I think you will see much more of, uh, of uh, data being uh, collected in the West. India is sort of getting there. Uh, yeah, I think both at the government side, so the government just recently launched a unified health ID. I think that is another big step in terms of saying, can we actually uh, create a platform uh, an integrated platform where all players can play on top of it and, and you can unify it, collect data, which, which can really support this activity. So I think there is a big move being made. Uh, uh, and, and I think the government, just like it did with the UPI system in, in, in the financial sector, I think it's, it's, it's using the whole uh, UHI and the NDHM uh, National Digital Health Mission to play that role, uh, even in the healthcare sector. 
because I, I think one of the factors with like a large country like India, uh, you need some integrator, and I think the government is playing the part of that uh, that integrator. So I think that is where we are today in terms of the whole AI space uh, and and how it, it's sort of evolving in, in in the market. What's it in in, in the global scenario? I think you'll see much more of AI models uh, in the in, in healthcare in the US. Uh, you'll see uh, a lot, a lot of that in Europe. In fact, Europe has laid out guidelines for sort of how to use AI in, in healthcare. China is emerging as a big, big market in the AI space. I think uh, they, they are uh, because of, of what they are as, as an economic and political system. They've been able to sort of put together much more in, in terms of uh, uh, healthcare-related AI. Uh, one example which I've listed is is Ping Yang AI. I think. Uh, this Ping Yang is basically an insurance company with a large insurance uh, uh, sort of customer base, but they have a very, very strong uh, AI system, which actually does primary care. Uh, they have these kiosks across China where, you know, a patient can go in and actually get treated using AI, even prescriptions can be given out. And, 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 and today, if you really see across a lot of the spectrum, Ping Yang is looks like is sort of the holy grail for people to reach to in in, in terms of uh, achieving the uh, AI, the so primary care in AI. I think that that's where the whole, whole play is going through. I think investments are required to really make all this happen. And this is just a chart to show you how much of investments have gone in in sort of healthcare AI companies over the last decade. So approximately eight and a half billion dollars. The top ten companies have got nearly five billion dollars of that. And this has been spread across three major markets, uh, US, Europe, and, and, and China. And I think uh, you know, investors see these as three growth markets to really, really uh, build out sort of models in, in, in this space. How does it look in AI in India? I think, I've, I've, I think it's, there is penetration of AI across the healthcare spectrum. I'll sort of list some areas uh, across the value chain. So hospitals, you'll, you've seen Manipal hospitals, having a IBM Watson for oncology treatment. Arvind Daikare uses the Google brain for retinal eye screening. In telemedicine, you see uh, remote providing clinical clinics, uh, Microsoft's mind platform, sick to play actually uh, does in pathology in terms of analyzing slides, et cetera. Uh, medical insurance uh, to improve workflow and, and claim management, ICICI Lombard, HDFC Live, et cetera, use AI fairly uh, a lot to, to do that. Again, in pharma, you'll see Abbott uh, Healthcare, et cetera, looking at either drug discovery or you know, models to sort of support therapy uh, usage. Also, distribution platforms today are using AI a lot to, to sort of support uh, uh, analytics and you know, the, the build out of, the, of their models. Again, diagnostics, which is sort of the forerunner of this, so Cure AI, WISA, Adveno Technologies, et cetera, have come out with many sort of AI solutions a lot more in screening, uh, but still something which is which is moving in, in the right direction of the clinical management. Again, in medical equipment, you have things like Nirmaya in, in the in the uh, maternal care, 3NT in the cardiac uh, care, where, where, where they can monitor uh, uh, patients, they can sort of use data uh, to basically uh, manage patients better. So, you, so you're seeing at the advent of, sort of AI in healthcare across the spectrum. I think there is there's no uh, area in healthcare today in India where, where it is not being used. Like I said, early days, and these are offshoots of how things will, will proceed. But I think that it's, there is definitely a, a move for using AI, even in a market like India, uh, which is this, this populous. Some use cases, which I thought would be interesting to put down, diagnostics, uh, point of care blood testing. You can go to a, a, a home today, uh, take take a uh, finger prick, uh, get the blood, uh, put it on a slide or some other uh, platform, and use AI to sort of uh, do quicker reading, remote readings, etc. Again, imaging and radiology, large tele uh, radiology networks have been created. I think radiology is one area where AI is being used heavily uh, uh, to do image analysis. You know, to to sort of right from just you know uh, things like uh, uh, regular uh, diseases but even if you see things like oncology like lung cancer you know uh, you you have a lot more x-rays and ct mri readings being done through ai uh, to at least provide the first level of screening 
uh, even in COVID, uh, AI is being used a fair bit to to see, you know, uh, X-rays of of uh, CTs of of uh, of the chest to see whether you know COVID results can come out much faster. So so that that's the sort of way it it's it been building out. I think these are sort of use cases in pathology and radiology where you will see much quicker adoption and much quicker uh, sort of use of AI. And I think these are the front runners of AI in the healthcare spectrum. Um, if you, if you go beyond that, I think areas like robotics or drug development, these are ones which are probably the other end of the healthcare spectrum in terms of the use of AI. They will require a huge amount of data to, to be uh, uh, sort of available, to be able to give us something meaningful. But I think this is, this is sort of what people aim for, right? I mean, if you have a, a, a robotic surgery, uh, you, you have a Da Vinci robot uh, today, uh, doctors use it, but not that effectively they, they use it for bariatric surgeries, et cetera, but not too much for other surgeries. But imagine if you had a, a, an AI algorithm on top where, you know, a doctor sitting in a, in, in, in say a city like Mumbai or Delhi could, could work on somebody remotely in a, in, in a smaller town and actually make, the, make surgeries happen. It could be a big game changer. And I think those are the kind of things which, uh, which uh, somebody hopes for. I think there are a lot of companies across the world which are working on it. And we, I think the speed of which innovation has happened in this space, I, I expect in the next five to, uh, five to 10 years that you will have really strong clinical applications in this space. Similarly, drug development. I think you, it has helped reduce the time for drug development significantly. And I think along with that, it has helped reduce the cost of drug development. Uh, because today you have AI can actually sift through various combinations of you know uh, uh, models uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, drug models to come up with at least sort of uh, sort through that and filter them out to come up with sort of something which is uh, more uh, developable more more so research can be done and that is playing a big role in terms of uh, helping support drug discovery in a big way both on on the uh, chemistry side but more so on the biotech side i think that's why you're seeing biotech as a as a, as yeah. a, a spectrum, just just pick up a, in a pace because of this kind of uh, support. Tracking of AI, I think in healthcare, in most places, when you say, uh, well, "What does AI do for you?" It is it is support, uh, reduce costs, maybe save time. I think these are the two areas. I think in healthcare, it does another thing: is save lives. I think that is one spectra where where, where you know you will see a lot more uh, support. What AI does in healthcare is basically create more access, more impact. It, it, it helps uh, you, you sort of reach more remote populations faster. And I think that is, is one uh, metric and impact which, which will definitely stand out as compared to many other sectors in, 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 in the industry. So I think right now you're seeing a lot more work happening in AI in terms of workflow management or screening. Uh, I think going forward, it, it's going to go more and more into clinical applications and, and, and sort of build out in, in, in that space. What do I see over the next uh, sort of uh, 10 to 15 years? Currently, like I said, near term is use of AI in administrative and repetitive tasks to help uh, healthcare professionals, uh, medical uh, specialties like radio, pathology, ophthalmology, derma. These are sort of the uh, early initial use cases. I think then it'll get into more deeper analytics, uh, support in terms of disease management in onco oncology, cardiology, neurology, lifestyle diseases, and like sort of primary care virtual assistance to, to really support uh, the delivery of primary care. Long term, I think is where I talked about saying you know drug development, better drug development, robotics, and wearable technology. Uh, growth markets. Like we say, right now it is still uh, US, Europe, China, but we expect it that even countries like India will play a major role going forward. Uh, AI applications, I think uh, I'd shown you a slide earlier where, where it, it was more in terms of diagnostics, which was leading it. But I think by the next 10 years, you will have the clinical decision making as, as one of the major factors where AI will play in the healthcare space. I think this is where our companies operate. We operate across the healthcare spectrum and most of our companies are working somewhere or the other in, in terms of uh, supporting digital health and AI applications in, in, in this space, more probably on the, uh, on the diagnostic side than on the, uh, than, than any other. 
so thank you i think uh, that's that's my presentation and uh, and uh, thank you for patient listening thank you mr sardesi that was a great uh, session um i think uh, we'll hand it i'll hand it back to mr ramakrishnan um if you can uh, share your slides I think yeah, you might be on mute. Hope you're able to hear me now. Yes. Right. I'm just sharing my screen now. Sure. Hope it's visible. Yes, it is. Excellent. Joe, <clears throat> uh, thanks for the introduction and. Uh, you know, talking about the potential of AI from assembly robots to automated warehouse, AI and manufacturing is a perfect combination. Uh, although its potential is yet to be captured to the fullest, the pandemic has accelerated the use of AI in manufacturing. Recent reports have, uh, uh, you know, shown that companies are warming up to AI. 66% of manufacturers using AI have reported higher reliance on AI, leading 20% companies are already using AI along with uh, uh, industrial IoT and blockchain to create a connected ecosystem. Besides, uh, as per reports, those companies that will invest in AI in the near future will also be able to double up their potential. As per the latest uh, Google report, the subsectors that are utilizing AI extensively are automotive OEMs, automotive suppliers and heavy machinery. This is all in the manufacturing sector we're talking about. And the top reasons for companies to utilize AI in the sector include business continuity assistance, increasing the employee efficiency overall. In fact, employee efficiency and overall cost efficiency is a big subject in the manufacturing world itself. So therefore manufacturers are tapping AI for improving their supply chain management, their risk management and their inventory management. So in terms of uh, when AI is applied to manufacturing, noticeable improvement has been seen in areas of uh, uh, original equipment efficiency optimization through predictive repair and maintenance, as well as the, you know, when the OE has emerged, the, the original equipment efficiency has emerged as a target for KPI for most manufacturers based on the three key indicators, which is uh, you know, availability, quality, and performance. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, quality 4.0, though operational excellence is achieved with uh, uh, continuous uh, improvement in production quality. At the same time, generative design through uh, AI and automation algorithms, which simultaneously generates multiple design solutions, are also valid for the same objective. Robotics, though, uh, you know, robotics through robotic and collaborative machines that supports uh, the operators to uh, free them from methodical or extremely precise tasks as well. Yeah. So in terms of the benefits of AI, uh, uh, you know, and the impact of AI in the manufacturing sector, uh, just-in-time manufacturing is one such, uh, you know, area where, uh, you know, adapted real-time production models offer a great level of optimization Sensors are tracking components by ordering them according to the demand patterns to reduce lead times. A lot of analytics also involved here, obviously. Then there is an introduction of, when we talk about introduction of new products, right? Uh, uh, you know, production lines do become information systems, right? That feed decision, uh, you know, uh, decision making on issues as product, uh, you know, as such as product lines. It also facilitates adaptation to demand making it easier to change raw materials, entering the factory process to the final product, leaving it. Uh, in terms of changes in consumption, consumers are looking for a connected experience. They expect products and experiences of a high quality and with a certain degree of personalization, this gives manufacturers an opportunity to create customized products without losing efficiency with the help of digital designs and intelligent production. In terms of uh, labor market evolution, 
uh, the increasing adoption of AI has created demand for data scientists, right? And I'm sure each one of you is aware that there's a bloodbath going on there as such uh, uh, in the IT sector, but uh, you know, data science is one field where a huge, a huge amount of demand and uh, the labor model also is moving towards more analytical and uh, you know qualified applicants in IT itself. Now, the benefits per se in terms of uh, you know AI, the AI techniques give rise to uh, you know four fundamental benefits, which include product optimization, supply chain integration, companies' adaptation to the market, and better product development. I would like to just quickly talk about the Madhasan Industry 4.0 digital solution suit, which enables everything in Industry 4. Uh, our Industry 4 digital solution suit helps enterprises to create end-to-end -end ecosystems. These offerings help enterprises to deal with any complications, handle unexpected high demands, uh, cope with dynamic markets, and overcome downtime from delays. I believe the best technologies are those that we stop noticing and start utilizing. And our solutions utilize technologies to make current manufacturing uh, you know, processes smarter, integrated, and connected. So what you see as <clears throat> Motiv Lake House, this is a core system for us, and it blends the power of BI and data science. It's a single platform for all your data needs. It simplifies uh, uh, you know, data governance with a single control point. At the same time, uh, we have Morango Ledger, which is an end-to-end -end, uh, uh, blockchain-enabled uh, track and trace solution and also very good for smart warehouse management. We have IDAX, which is a industrial IoT based uh, ERP machine agnostic system, which enables uh, real time data acquisition and production monitoring capabilities. Essentially, it's a you know, manufacturing execution system. Uh, we also have Robis, which is an affordable set of robotic engines and assisted guided vehicles. Over 200 plus companies are getting, I mean, uh, 200 plus uh, you know, robots are getting utilized in the Madison group itself. We also have Hencon, which is a uh, unified digital platform that enables enterprises to accelerate their digital journey by reimagining modern application development. So, but, you know, it, on one side it helps you connect to uh, different backend systems. At the same time, it create, gives you a fantastic, uh, uh, you know, ecosystem to create application and then release and deploy them very quickly. Uh, finally, the motive suit, uh, itself, right, is a set of applications that uh, provides intelligent insights across different functions, sales, procurement, finance, operations, HR, audit, and others. I miss out on prophecy. That's actually an AML engine which enables, uh, you know, any kind of predictions or forecasting-based uh, applications. So to give you a quick, uh, you know, video snapshot, I'll just, I don't know whether I enable the sound, but sound doesn't matter. Not required, really. So these are highlighting some of the you know challenges uh, in the uh, in a typical manufacturing company, and uh, how Motif, uh, which is uh, the factory analytic solution of Motif, is able to circumvent those. You know, we are today powering over 500 plus users across uh, 1,000, you know, multiple plants across uh, 41 different locations across the globe, right? And uh, whether it be uh, production quality or, uh, you know, analyzing downtime or monitoring the production performance or monitoring conditions of various sensors, various devices, uh, you know, it's top notch. Uh, today, Motor Factory is uh, enabled in, uh, you know, uh, multiple plants for the group, as well as uh, we are implementing it for some of the largest uh, manufacturers, not only in the automotive sector, incidentally, but in the areas of, uh, you know, consumer electronics in, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, pharma sector as well and production uh, in the automotive sector also uh, in the o amongst the OEMs. There's a lot of uh, implementations of factory analytics now. And then just to give you a quick uh, use case on predictive quality this is for a six billion dollar group that uh, you know we did uh, the complete uh, solution 
the client is a leading manufacturer of vehicle brakes in india and they were facing challenges with scrap parts and they didn't know you know they didn't have a tool uh, which would help them identify suspected good quality parts and uh, as a solution we implemented more the factory analytic solution there that allows them to get the accurate prediction of uh, production quality a network of multiple machine learning models analyzes test parameters and allows the plant managers to identify defective pieces change and adjust the parameters of uh, uh, the machine or assets for improving the quality of the products with accurate probability of estimated failures and simultaneously achieve significant reduction in the overall scrap uh, scrap which is also known as uh, you know muda in japanese is a very essential part i mean scrap management is a very essential part of any manufacturing company this effectively resulted in higher savings and better quality of the products the services utilized for predictive quality included data engineering data visualization data science and application development all this on top of our own uh, you know motive solution as a result they were drastically able to improve the quality of the products and reported 50% reduction in customer rejects and noticeable reduction in manual labor uh, just one more uh, you know uh, case we had recently where we implemented a, a greenfield factory a smart factory for a consumer electronics company uh, we utilized uh, you know hp infrastructure along with uh, uh, hp has a beautiful green lake uh, framework which when paired with motif and idax from our stables uh, we enabled a 58 year old japanese electrical equipment conglomerate to embrace data driven culture and drive a much better customer experience the client was you know earlier unable to derive value from the large amounts of data being generated through utilization of variety of machines and some of the challenges they faced included manual tracking of bins and shop floor uh, uh, shop floor operations which led to inconsistency in the data itself and the mismatch of data that uh, you know occurred the data error in, in fact in data uh, was mm, hold on definitely mm, right. yeah and data entered in the erp itself the issue of the incorrect raw materials procurement from stores okay. to workstation leading to wastage mm. uh, and decline in operation efficiency due to frequent mm. downtime manual effort that's right hoga zarur positive hoga can everyone else go on mute please yeah, yeah sorry I mean, please we told to get uh, sorry please put yourself on mute thank you jua yeah the solution allows enterprises to have a clear view of disparate data sources through a centralized dashboard the idax uh, our mea system gathers data and motif which is our uh, bi layer is added on top to provide insights it gives a clear visibility of the shop floor operations by giving out near real time intelligent insights it provides alerts to the plant managers to you know whenever the production goes above or below the threshold of the forecast it reduces the manual efforts of the workforce and provides a clear view of uh, the warehouse stock management daily invoicing details a clear view of the kpis making uh, each member of the uh, you know in the in the plant accountable and with effective planning of machine maintenance also to reduce downtime now with hp idax and uh, motif the framework we created we have enabled the enterprise to switch from a legacy based model I mean, mind you this company was completely into brownfield uh, uh, you know factories and the first greenfield factory they created one of a kind and now they're going to take it across the globe uh, you know to every place where they have a factory right so uh, that's it from me and uh, you know uh, i think we'll have q and a in the end right sir yes we will thanks tom thank you mr ramakrishnan uh, that was really interesting i definitely <laughs> learned a lot i appreciate it um for our final talk i welcome uh, mr atar shahab who is the joint managing director of zuari global limited uh prior to this he was working as the chief executive of naba power limited and he was also the head of corporate strategy of lnt at mumbai he is a visiting faculty at premier management institutes such as mdi sp jain institute of management and research and isb so help please uh, please help me welcome mr shahab thank you joya for this wonderful introduction and uh, i must say that 
last five years i was working in a power generation utility and uh, grappling with a lot of uh, challenges and also trying to harness the power of uh, ai in whatever i did and i am just about uh, two months old into this current role and for those who are not aware zuari global is the apex holding company of advance group it's part of the erstwhile kk birla group it is one of the largest manufacturers of fertilizers and chemicals in the country we own marquee companies such as zuari agrochemicals paradi phosphates and mangalore chemicals and fertilizers we also own one of the oldest uh, rail wagon manufacturing companies uh, namely tex macro rail and engineering uh, a few years ago we acquired an epc company called uh, kalindi rail nirman so we do rail epc as well as a large conglomerate with interests in fertilizers chemicals infrastructure real estate uh, we also have a sugar plant so plenty on the table and when uh, gurdeep called me and said you have to speak on ai in in agriculture you know honestly i was at a loss because last 5 years i have been running a power generation utility so let me begin by just recounting my experience uh, which and a very interesting experience that i had for 5 years so i landed in this uh, utility which is uh, a highly sophisticated 24 by 7 operation and you only realize the complexity once you land into it every other manufacturing process you can stop start you can plan your product mix but this is an absolutely relentless process that is totally integrated you are integrated with the state grid you are integrated with the national grid and you have to respond not in not in hours and minutes you have to respond in milliseconds right and i was amazed by the marvels of technology that make it possible anything happens in the grid uh, for some things the response time is is 10 milliseconds 30 milliseconds and i still remember my awe when i first went and there was an outage and i was checking the printout on the computer everything was recorded in milliseconds and the whole system in any case operates with a lot of features uh, which are which will be very close to artificial intelligence but they were all designed to to prevent a disaster they were all safety oriented they were all reliability oriented and uh, like joya said i'm also an ai enthusiast so i thought what am i going to do and uh, can we bring in some elements of machine learning ai and what are the areas and we made some very interesting interventions and as hari was speaking i was actually remembering my experience because we did a lot of work on uh, predictive analytics we did a very nice exper uh, you know experiment on uh, iot based uh, predictive analytics then we imposed a layer of predictive analytics on our turbines and we got excellent uh, results then we developed a business forecasting model because um, you when know, you run a utility you don't know what kind of demand uh, you will be faced with in the next 24 hours next week next month and how do you then adapt the entire supply chain and everything has to adapt to the demand and when i went there everybody had given up practically and they were carrying huge amount of inventories assuming the worst possible scenario so we built a very nice business forecasting model and uh, some basic principles of ml were used and over a period of time as the model was learning it became smarter and smarter and i felt very happy seeing the model actually become much much better and that encouraged me then to take up a very massive business planning exercise which i which we love to call planning to firing because you are planning to run a very large uh, generating utility you are carting coal which is 1500 kilometers away there is a massive logistics operation you are getting coal from a dozen subsidiaries of coal india of varying grades varying quality and you have a demand profile which is very uncertain so how do you optimize the whole thing to make sure that a you are available b you produce cheapest power and c you you also optimize your profits and uh, very glad to tell you that it was a, a successful in house exercise in lnt we we hold uh, something called pi awards where a lot of uh, teams compete across the organization to get a coveted pi award for innovation last year this project actually got 
uh, the gold medal in the uh, annual Pi Awards of LNT. And um, I'm very proud to have been the mentor of that team that actually did all this work in house. So, with all that background, I land here, and Gurdeep catches up with me and says, uh, uh, Joya and I are cooking this up. So, why don't you speak about uh, AI in agriculture? So, what do I do? I, I do some Googling, I do some research, and some very interesting research. Uh, and very honestly and candidly, uh, it's absolutely not original. And I continue to be an enthusiast uh, as far as AI in agriculture is concerned. And I just want to show you what I, what I found out. And um, Yoya, if you permit me to share my screen, can you see the screen? Yes. Yes. So there you go. And uh, this is the first thing that I came across. Blue River gets 3.1 million for a weed whacking robot. Right? And it's very interestingly put. Future of computer vision and machine learning can be seen trundling at about a mile an hour at a lettuce field in the Salinas Valley of California. And you see this robot on the right, what does it do? It moves around in the field and it is removing the weeds as it moves around at one mile per hour. There are three different algorithms inside this robot. The first one is taking the readings. There is a camera facing the ground, identifying whether it is seeing a plant or not. Second one tells the robot whether one plant has ended and whether the other one is beginning. And lastly, there's a classify algorithm which determines the plant is a weed or not. I think it's amazing actually, when you can remove the use of pesticides and can get a robot to kill the weeds. I think it's, it's a very, very exciting development and good to see startups getting funding for such a venture. <laughs> Similarly, uh, this self-driving robot on your next screen and some write-up from the Forbes magazine, nutrient content of our vegetables is down 40% over the last two decades. Soil health is suffering because of harsh herbicide use. And it's very, very true of India as well. And you know, we are eating, literally eating poison actually because of the pesticides that go into our, our food. So what have they done? They have designed this robot and self-driving robot, which kills 100,000 weeds an hour. And it uses laser. So deep learning expertise, use of laser, laser technology, and you have this self-driving farm robot. What next? I came across this very interesting insight. Machine learning can pinpoint genes of importance that can enable plants to grow more with less fertilizer. What are we staring at? By 2050, the world would need 70% more food. Land is not going to grow. It's going to become less. Resources are going to be limited. You need 70% more food. You can imagine the importance of this research huge amount of data is being analyzed. And it's all being used to find out how you can play around with nutrition, toxins, and pathogen exposure that affects agricultural output. How can you improve the crop yields? Think of disease prognosis, et cetera. And interestingly, all this has been made possible by machine learning. And very interesting research. And I really hope that uh, they attract uh, uh, funding from venture capitalists to take this forward. And lastly, a very interesting uh, uh, use case using some management uh, consulting language, but a very interesting uh, development, how AI is helping Indian cotton farmers reduce pesticide use. 58 lakh cotton farmers in India. And they faced a loss of 15,000 crore in 2017 as the crop was attacked by pests. I also found that 55% of pesticides in India are actually consumed by cotton farmers. So a very interesting experiment was done to, to deal with this 
And you must watch this very interesting video on YouTube to see how this was done. It'll just take a couple of minutes. Good. So back to our presentation. So you have a real use case and a huge benefit of AI derived by cotton farmers when they were dealing with the, the problem of pests. So going forward, in fact, a lot of this is already happening uh, globally. And I think for a country like India, nobody can overstate the advantages and particularly being a country with uh, limited resources i think extremely important and agriculture is the core of of the indian economy a lot of people still dependent on agriculture a uh, plenty of uh, options crop yield prediction and price forecast uh, some of this is already in play and i think uh, the the connectivity through the internet makes pricing much much uh, uh, easier for farmers and, and players in the trade to get a handle on. But crop yield prediction is something that, that will really uh, help Indian farmers a lot in, in times to come. Intelligent spraying is a technique where right now you waste so many herbicides and pesticides, you spray the entire area. The technology is emerging where you use sensors that can actually detect weed and you can optimize the spraying of herbicides and pesticides. I think this will, this will not only reduce the usage of herbicides and, and save costs, it will also positively impact the health of uh, customers all around. Predictive insights, which is the right time to sow for maximum productivity. So weather data, moisture data, and a whole lot of that 
I think will come into play. Agricultural robots, we saw some examples. Crop and soil monitoring, you know, we are a fertilizer company and we produce all kinds of fertilizers. Unfortunately, in this country, not enough attention has been given to monitoring the health of the soil. And we have used uh, all kinds of fertilizers uh, quite generously and liberally without realizing the long-term consequences of that. That needs to change. And I think we need an optimal amount of fertilizer of different types. You have N, P, K, and you have urea. What is most suitable for a particular soil should come to use of AI rather than just the gut feel of the, of the farmer. And last but not the least, a disease uh, diagnosis. So what's affecting the, the crop? Can it be uh, forecasted in advance? What kind of effort should be taken proactively to prevent or at least minimize crop damage? I think the possibilities are very exciting and endless. As a company which is wedded into the, the agricultural reality of this country, we are part of the political economy at a very fundamental level. I see very interesting and exciting uh, prospect for use of AI in, in agriculture. Thank you very much for your uh, listening patiently. And I, I must say, I have, I have learned much more than I, than I have shared. Thank you very much, Joy and everybody for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, with that, um, I will, I know we're kind of, we're running a little bit over time, but um, I'll open it now to any questions that the audience might have. I mean, I have some questions too, but um, if anyone in the audience has questions, um, the floor is yours. <laughs> Well, um, I guess let me let me kick uh, the discussion off. Um, this is addressed to all the speakers. You know, we we hear a lot of advantages to AI and you know across industries, but at the same time, there's a lot of misconceptions or what I call fears when we um, talk about artificial intelligence. For example, there's this fear that it will replace a number of jobs. Can you um, speak to me um, of some of the misconceptions that each of you might have seen in general or in each of your industries? Sure, sure. So Jaya, uh, you know, like you said, loss of employment is a big, big uh, factor that a lot of people in different countries feel with respect to including AI or uh, bots right, in our environment. And, you know, in the manufacturing sector, we, we use uh, different kinds of bots along with AI. We have uh, bots which are collaborative, which, you know, uh, work along with humans in the same space. Uh, we also have, uh, uh, sorry, there are the cooperative bots. And then we have, I mean, the collaborative bots. And then we have the cooperative bots, which basically... Uh, you know, go around in a specific, uh, uh, you know, zone, do a specific task, which is assigned to them along with maybe some capabilities of assisted guided vehicles, etc. Now, a lot of people in the past have felt that, you know, these kind of bots actually take up the job of humans. Actually, they, they simplify our jobs because, you know, look at it this way. I mean, let's say you had to uh, pick up components for a, uh, you know, production line and a human who would have uh, had to take up the task of picking up different uh, components from different parts of the warehouse and bringing it to the production line could make mistakes and that could roll into you know uh, production losses which in, in turn goes on to you know uh, cost implications which in turn goes on to eventually job losses right so a better way of doing that is using uh, you know assisted guided vehicles and bots, which basically have a, a schema. There is a, there are softwares in the back end, like our, uh, you know, Morango Ledger, which I spoke about. It guides you to give you the best uh, way to retrieve, you know, all the uh, components that you need from within the warehouse, plots the best way. And thereafter, the uh, bot can, uh, you know, go through that entire uh, way, pick up the 
uh, pieces. Uh, we also use uh, AI-based uh, technology for, uh, you know, uh, uh, with augmented reality, where even if a human wants to use it, we have a, uh, you know, pick, we call it pick to light, where the light shines on the boxes which need to be picked and the human just goes and picks the box where the light shines, right? Simple things which actually make the life of humans better, right? So this is one misconception, definitely, which uh, drops up. Uh, and another thing is, uh, you know, about uh, uh, AI being, or AI or bots being too costly, right? In fact, we have seen the, the you know, complete reverse. In, in fact, in the last, uh, you know, five years, as the Madison Group itself has grown, drastically uh, we've more than doubled our uh, you know top line at the same time we've uh, obviously grown inorganically as well in a big way and that meant uh, you know optimizing costs uh, you know at multiple uh, levels right and one of the things that enabled us to optimize costs is use of ai in a big way to understand where exactly are the places where we are losing out in money and this you know simple things like you know uh, two different suppliers or five different suppliers you know supplying the same raw material right and we use ai i mean algorithms ml algorithms today to identify you know the optimized uh, you know best raw material suppliers across the world across different regions for every different uh, uh, you know company unit and we have 200 plus companies in the group so it really helps us you know save anywhere between 5 to 10 percent now in a you know, multi-billion dollar group, a five, ten percent saving in bottom line is, is huge. In it can it can be billions of dollars of savings, right? And that's 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 what we're talking about when we use AI analytics, uh, you know, put together. I I would also like to take a shot, uh, Joya, if you permit, uh, sure, an answer to this question. And I think in my personal experience, when you use AI and ML, you're not looking at uh, substituting people at the bottom of the pyramid. Actually, what happens, senior people, particularly very senior people, are in the habit of optimizing things in their head. Not realizing that it's humanly impossible in today's interconnected world. There are so many imponderables. It is regardless of how well you are paid and how many years or decades of experience you possess. It's absolutely not possible. Not one human being, not 10 people, not 100 people can sit together and optimize a complex situation in business, whether it is healthcare, agriculture, manufacturing, whatever it is. So it is, and, and you need to be safe, you need to be reliable, and you need to be super efficient. And now that's only something that AI can do. So my experience of dealing with it in my all my assignments is absolutely no worries about replacing anyone. Gone are the days when people were protesting in banks that don't bring in computers, they're going to replace clocks. We are way beyond all that, right? Yeah, I think I'd, I'd like to say the same thing. It's, uh, I, I think AI and, and, uh, and sort of uh, the whole uh, digital piece basically expands the market. I think it, it does not, uh, it, it opens up many more markets. It opens up many more areas which you would never really uh, have, have gotten to. And, and, and improves outcomes. So uh, on, on the overall thing, I think, yes, there is a lot, a lot more noise around uh, uh, job losses, but I think it also helps job creation because it basically creates much more uh, expansion of market. I think that, that's the real key in this whole, whole exercise. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we actually have a question, if I can. Oh, sure. Yeah. Thank you, Joya. This is Professor Aman Agarwal from Indian Institute of Finance. I'd like to thank all the speakers for insightful information on the AI and the ML framework. Uh, my question is, if you could give some insight on the financial costs or the financial benefits you've had. I did have one who said about 5% cost savings, which are there. But if you could give a more specific example of what you have implemented and what kind of financial costs and benefits you have been able to get out of the business when implementing AI. Uh, Professor Aman, uh, what I shared was uh, a factual data about what we've actually implemented and what we've actually got. In fact, uh, uh, in the next three years, if you've seen the published, uh, you know, uh, target uh, by our group as well, we'll aim to be a $36 billion group by 2025. And when we hit $36 billion in top line, that's about $20 billion in spend. A 5% reduction in cost there will be a billion dollars in savings for me. Today, 
uh, over the last five years, we've been able to achieve in the range of around seven to eight percent in cost savings. We are even we are aiming to augment that cost saving further by another five percent over the next three years to ensure that we save that billion dollars in the next three years. Right. So this is factual inputs that I'm giving you. Right. And uh, like I said, you know, when you when you start uh, looking at your business uh, in a very different way, I mean, on a day to day basis, let's say you have Excel sheets coming in, uh, whether you're a consumer electronics company, whether you're a you know, agriculture company or a pharma company or a manufacturing company, as a CXO or a CEO, you're seeing reports coming in, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Mr. Arthur spoke about, right? Uh, 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 people are crunching data and they're presenting it to you in different formats, right? But then it takes a lot of brainy heads to, you know, put together their experience. And even then you might miss some points, but then AI is able to capture the anomalies for you, right? I mean, imagine for, you know, uh, our, com our group is a 45 year old group and almost, uh, you know, 40 years we've been growing, but many of the things that we found in the last five years, we had not found in the last 40 years with respect to where we're losing costs, right? So. That's what I'm talking about with uh, respect to using AI in uh, you know, live environments. So how much did you go about spending in terms of the investment you made in AI so that you could give this kind of savings which you are projecting? So let me put it this way. I mean, uh, currently for a particular customer, right, uh, we're implementing a complete factory analytic solution for one factory for them, right? It's going to cost them roughly around uh, less than a million dollars, right? To implement the entire system and manage it for the next three years, right? And, uh, you know, the savings is uh, going to be huge because they're going to save up on a whole lot of, uh, uh, you know, manual process and manual effort that they would have put up. At the same time, they would also end up, uh, you know, saving at least around, uh, you know, in the range of 10 to 15% in the first couple of years itself from a brownfield operation to a greenfield operation, right? And that for a, uh, you know, business, which is, uh, let's say, uh, around 10,000 crores, right, is huge amount of savings. I hope you understand. Sure. Um, I think we have uh, two more questions from the audience. Um, uh, one of the questions is, are there any good Indian companies in the AI space or is India dependent on foreign um, AI com companies for collaboration? Hey, we are an Indian company. <laughs> Mother son. Okay. <laughs> Established in 1975. All right. All right. Um, and are there incidentally any we other started other... with uh, Incidentally, we started with uh, enabling Maruti with wire harnesses. Today, we provide IT services to uh, all companies across the globe. Zoom All right. Um, yeah, I think uh, um, Mr. Laha, I think might have a question. Okay. <clears throat> thanks very much. It's a wonderful presentation for all of you guys. Uh, thanks very much. I learned quite a lot. Um, I have used AI in the early days when a 1980s, when the main thing is that we are using AI for the certain design, hardware design, which cannot be done otherwise. So AI, uh, the way I, 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 I studied AI, AI has two, two parts. One part is there are certain problems Certain problem cannot be solved otherwise without AI. Hmm. Certain complex problems which cannot be solved without AI. The military, uh, US Army, Navy, uh, US uh, NASA, they have used AI in the 70s and 80s. They have used it. And of course, certain things can be, every business has to be cost effective. And certain routine jobs can be used using AI, can be done much faster. And also it relate to it will, what will happen as a result, certain jobs will disappear. Certain routine jobs will disappear. That's the fact of life. But hopefully 
more jobs will come in more jobs will come in you know mr ramkrishnan talking about his bottom line going up and which is rightly so certain things he can do much faster these days the speed is the most important thing you know product important thing so i see that ai is a tremendous addition to the every manufacturing industry they are going to use it ai every industry going to use they are using already using ai uh, as a result of that no so you say welcome things new technology coming in and it's a welcome thing it will be much faster everything will be much faster much better much quality will be much better that's my assessment okay <laughs> thank you i know we're we're really um kind of over time um i just wanted to invite uh, mr gurdeep singh i think he was going to give some closing remarks Thank you, Joya. I start with an ignited mind is the most powerful weapon on the earth, and this is got through knowledge. And knowledge is the most profitable investment. I, Gurdeep Singh, business head for Zwari Management Services, member of Council SMEs, feel honored to propose a vote of thanks to all the esteemed delegates. guest speakers and moderator joya for gracing today's webinar and sharing their valuable insights with us we have been fortunate to have renowned personalities from different industries and functions you all are, are inspirational with the dedicated support from within council smes valuable inputs from well wishers and participation by you all has contributed to the success of this program thank you all for your guidance support and motivation finally thank you to all the participants and audience for your presence involvement and enthusiasm we look forward to seeing you at our future programs it's been a great pleasure thank you very much Thank you.